I know that the first time that the word worship is ever mentioned in the Bible, it had to do with laying something down. It was when Abraham was going to offer his son Isaac. And I wanted to talk not just about finances in worship, but just in worship in general. Worship is not just keys. Worship is not just a song that you put on. Worship has to and always requires the heart. It always requires the heart. And you know, Matthew chapter 6 talks to us about how connected our treasure is to our heart in just some way. And I I remember being taught that as just a young man about how you want to engage your heart, you engage your treasure. You want to love somebody, you want to, you're struggling. And my pastor told me this, he said, buy them a fruit basket. (laughs) If you're struggling to love somebody, send them a fruit basket. In other words, when you sow into somebody, it it changes your posture. As much as you're trying in your mind, as much as you're trying, it positions your heart to love them and the love of God to, to work. So just uh, it always stuck with me. And again, just talking about what, what does worship look like? It always looks like the first law first mentioned in the Bible, right? It always looks like laying something down, laying something down. And so anyway, we're just going to do that tonight. We're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And um, and then after that, we're going to uh we're going to be watching this uh, this teaching, and then we're going to put it to practice at the end. How many of you loved last week? Wasn't it so good? So good. How many of you from Sunday have been letting your imagination go to work a little bit in the right direction? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like your imagination, like it's supposed to be working for you to produce. I, I said this last night <clears throat> to uh, uh, our leadership team. And I said, I, I, I got a, a piece of paper, or a booklet of papers, and I said, hey, I want to show you something. So I kind of made it look like I was about to, you know, flip a page and, and show them a picture. And I said, I want to show you something. Close your eyes. And I pr- began to speak. And they could see something with their eyes closed. And, you know, that's, that's one of the number one ways that the Lord, the Bible tells us he leads his children by the inward witness. So many times we're looking with our natural eyes. And I, even today I was listening to a word of the Lord and, and uh, it, it seemed like it was, uh, things were bad and, and things were dark and, and, and this man, he said it, it, Lord, is there, is there any hope? And the Lord said you're looking with your wrong eyes. He said, close your eyes. And so he closed his eyes. And what he saw was a completely different picture. He saw a picture of, of, of the fire of God in, in his people, carrying that and lighting, lighting the darkness. But when he just looked with these eyes, and so I just, again, just reiteration of what we talked about Sunday, the imagination that God has given you. He's given you to see the hope to which you've been called. And tonight, what we're talking about, the battle, we're not just talking about battling so we can get something else. We're, not, we're talking about destinies and you and your family and, and, and you walking in the fullness to which you've been called. Ephesians chapter 1, that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened and that you would know the hope to which you've been called. There's your destiny. Like I don't, You're not here by accident tonight. What we're talking about, about leading our life and directing our life, one of the number one things you and I need to get is we need to get the right picture. We need to get the right destination to where God's calling us. And sometimes the only way to see is by closing your eyes. Amen? Amen. Uh, so we're going to give tonight. We're going to pray over these tithes and offerings. Then we're going to hit play. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for what you're doing in this house and these people. Father, we, we partnered with us. Uh, thank you that we're not alone. Thank you that uh, you're the strength of our life. You're the hope. You are a sh- the good shepherd. We, we thank you that you do. You lead us beside still water. We thank you that your, your rod and your staff, they comfort us. We thank you that uh, you lead us through. Father, that you anoint our heads with oil, that you don't send somebody else, but you're present. Father, thank you for that. We commit our tithes and our offerings to you tonight. Lord, we ask you for the vision, clarity, and the impact. We lift them to you tonight. Multiply it. Great impact for your glory, that many people will come to know Jesus, your son as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Go ahead and give, and then we'll hit play, Brian.
should not have faith in God just because your mom and dad did. Your faith in God shouldn't be based on your denomination or your group. That's not enough. I said it's not enough. Your faith should be in the power of God. And you should have experienced the power of God in the new birth. And that shouldn't be the end of it. That should be the beginning of a walk with God wherein you experience. Everybody say experience. experience. You experience manifestations of God's power in your life. You don't just write flowery things about God and hang it on your wall and it's just, you know, mental assent or doctrinal belief. You have experience in the reality of God. You've experienced the person of the Lord and by His Spirit. Said out loud, I have faith, I have faith. in the power of God. The scripture also talked about that there'd come a time that uh, there'd be a group of people that uh, they would have a form of godliness, but they would deny the power. And so that is religion. That's men's religion. And there's, there's a lot of folks that, you know, they, they do religion as a ritual. Yeah. And yet, they, they deny any manifestation of God's power. It's why they reject healing. They reject speaking in tongues. They reject the gifts and manifestations of the Spirit. They, they reject uh, miracle manifestations in the finance and material realm. They just, they go, they go I, I don't believe in all that stuff. Well, you deny the power. And then you got people that actually go to church that uh, deny or say they're not sure about the virgin birth or about the literal physical resurrection because that requires believing in miracles, right? If Jesus was conceived without a human father, that's a miracle. That's a manifestation of the power of God, right? And if you don't believe that, you're not saved. You're not a Christian. And the Bible said that God raised him from the dead. How many believe that he went to the cross and that he died? And how many believe the rest that after three days he rose from the dead? Now if you say, well, I, you know, does that really matter? Isn't it just important that we, we, we listen to the, the moral teachings of Jesus? No, listen. If you don't believe he raised from the dead, you are lost. Amen. You are not saved. You won't make heaven. Now, I know people don't like that, but you either believe the Bible or you don't. People say, well, I got a right to my beliefs. Not if you're a Christian. No, if you're a Christian... That means you're submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. You're supposed to believe what he tells you. Yes. Not just make up stuff as you go along. Now if you're not going to be a Christian, well sure, you believe anything you want to. Yes, sir. <laughs> Do we need to play games with this? No, sir. When heaven and hell is the difference. Yes. It's no time to mince words. That's right. And now while we're breathing, while we've got time, is we've got opportunity to change yes. and to make it right. And to get it right. I, I don't want to find out that somebody missed heaven because I, I was uh, pri trying to be too politically correct. Yes, they, they weren't clear on what I was saying when they attended the service. <laughs> Thought maybe they'd be okay, you know, without Jesus. No, no, you won't be. Am I saying it plain enough? You must be born again. And in order to be born again, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God, born of a virgin, died on the cross, raised from the dead. On the third day, he's sitting at the right hand of majesty on high, soon to come again, King of kings, 
Lord of Lords, and there is no salvation in any other name. You cannot come to God except through Jesus. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. And I believe the Bible. Right? I know I get worked up about it, but it's, it's important. Go to Romans, if you would, the 10th chapter. Now, what we begin to see is that the Spirit of God through Paul, he said, my word and my preaching was in demonstration of the Spirit and power. You could say it like this. If you look up the words, the, the word, Greek word for word is logos, and the Greek word for power is dunamis. And you could say it like this. In that language, you could say, my logos was with dunamis. My word was with power. And we saw uh, last Sunday that uh, one of the things that startled people that heard Jesus is that same phrase, they said his word is with power. And so if you're talking about the power of God, certainly you saw that in the ministry and life of Jesus. You saw the power of God manifested in all kinds of amazing healings and deliverances, miracles, and even people being raised from the dead, amazing things. And the number one way that that power was released was by the words that Jesus spoke. Isn't that right? Be clean. Be loosed. Be healed. Get up. <laughs> right? Or to the enemy. Get out. <laughs> right? Is it a coincidence that the power of God manifested when he spoke? No. That's how it worked. That's how he did the works. Now one of the biggest mistakes that, that the church has made is in relegating everything he did to an unattainable category to us. Saying, well, yeah, but now that was Jesus. Jesus could do that, but not you, you know. <laughs> Why? Because he's God. And so you're saying he did what he did as God. And of course, if that's true, then you can't do it because you're not God. But yet, he said, if you believe on me, the works I do, you'll do also. Didn't he say that? And greater works than these shall you do. How in the world could you believe that if he did the works as God? You can't believe that. So is the Bible right or wrong? Is Jesus right or wrong? I hope you know the answer to that. Huh? <laughs> Come on, say it out loud. Jesus is right. Jesus is right. right about what? Oh, yeah, everything. <laughs> That's a safe answer. You, you know you're right when you say that. And he is right about everything. But that particular thing is that right about you being able to do what he did. But you won't do it a different way. The servant's not above his or her master. Uh, how did he do it? You, we, we, we talked about last week Mark 11 and also Matthew 21 about how Jesus spoke to that fig tree and it dried up from the roots. And when the disciples marveled, he took it as an opportunity to teach them. And he said, if you have faith and not doubt, you can not only do what was done to the fig tree, but if you say to that mountain, be removed, and not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you said came to pass, you'd have what you said. Is he telling them they can do what he did? As plain as you can say it. And yet, religion doesn't believe that. Most church-going people don't believe that. And that's why there's such a lack of the manifestation of the power of God in so many places. But you got to make up your mind. Are you going to believe what he said? Yes. Our religious tradition. Notice what he said, in, in, notice what the word said in Romans 10 and 6. 
one of the greatest miracles without, without question that you will ever experience or be a part of is the new birth, being born again. Being born again is not being fixed, is not soul healing. Mm -mm. It's not soul healing. It's not being repaired or fixed. It is a recreation. All things are passed away. All things have become new. Now you know that's not on the outside because after you got born again, you look in the mirror, you look just like you did yes. right before. It wasn't your body. So it's the hidden man of the heart, but inside you are not the same person. That's right. You didn't get spiritually healed or fixed. You got recreated. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Hallelujah. And your sins didn't get covered. No. A number of our even songs that people sing and even hymns have unscriptural verses in them. Yeah. And uh, sins being covered is an Old Testament phrase. Their sins were covered under the first covenant with the blood of animals. And Hebrews says that blood of animals could never take away sin. Which is why it couldn't satisfy the requirements of justice. But the blood of the one and only spotless Lamb of God, hallelujah, has the zoe, the life is in the blood, and the life of God is in the blood of the Son of God. And that blood doesn't just cover your sins. It washes your sins away. They're gone. Washes them away. Your sins are not covered as a Christian. Your sins are washed away. Come on, say it out loud. My sins are washed away. If they're covered, maybe sometime you could uncover them. And right. They're still there. Nuh-uh, yeah. nuh, -uh, nuh -uh. If they're washed away, you can't find them. You can't find them, which is why the Lord said that your sins and iniquities wouldn't be remembered. They wouldn't be mentioned to you again. So if he doesn't see them, quit bringing it up. <laughs> Verse 6, Romans 10, 6, it says, The righteousness which is of, of faith speaks on this wise, say not, did, did you hear this word? He starts off by saying what you say. Don't say this. Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or, in other words, don't say this either. Who will descend into the deep to bring Christ again from the dead? You getting saved is not about you attaining the highest heights and reaching the ninth level of enlightenment in heavenly places or whatever. These other religions that teach this stuff are absolute lies and wrong. I know millions of people believe it, but the Bible and that can't be true. Both of them can't be true. They contradict each other. You got to decide what you believe. He says, but what saith it? The word, the what? Word. The what? Word. He started out talking about saying something. Now he's talking about your word. The word is near you, even in your mouth. Now, I want you to notice how he's very specific. He mentions in your mouth more than once because this is not just a word you think. This is a word you say out loud. The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. Come on, say it out loud. In your mouth and in your heart. Say it again. In your mouth and in your heart. One more time. In your mouth and in your heart. That is, he said, the word of faith which we preach. 
which is why we continue to preach the word of faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to be in good company. Yes. Paul is good company. Yes. Jesus is good company. Yes. The Holy Spirit is good company. Yes. Now the reason I'm repetitive on this is because most of the church has been robbed of this. And it's been robbed of it for generations now to the point that people sometimes come and visit a place like us and hear us stand up and make all these confessions and they think it's strange. Is it really necessary to say all that stuff? Actually it is. I say it is. If you want results. But it's been lost in a large degree to the church. People think it's not necessary. And people think it's no big deal, the words that come out of their mouth. They say all manner of things that they don't mean. And they're like, you know, I even, I've even seen Christians that have used this phrase as part of their uh, ministry description. I'm just saying. Well, that phrase, I'm just saying. What does that mean? It means I'm talking, I'm making sounds, but it don't mean anything. Huh? Yeah. I'm, 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 saying, I'm saying stuff, but you don't need to pay any attention to it. It doesn't matter. You can't get any further from the Word of God. <laughs> we, we read last week, Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Is that true or not? How important are the words coming out of your mouth? According to the Bible, it's life and death. Do most Christians believe that? You know they don't by the way they talk. You know they don't by the way they talk. And James talks about that if you don't miss it in what you say, you're a perfected individual. Isn't that something? Well, we all got room to grow. But how many think Jesus walked in this level? And he said, I, I don't say, uh, I don't speak of myself. I didn't come to do my own will. I only say what I hear the Father say. Was Jesus very disciplined in what he said? And was his word with power? Is there a connection between that? Now, if you were here Friday, um, you know, Brother Jerry Savelle was here. And uh, did you hear, how many were here? Let me see you. Okay. He talked about how that for, what, 50 some years now that he has had favor. He has had amazing things happen in his life. I know of some of them. And do you think that most people have experienced the kind of amazing things that he has? No, they have not. But did you also hear? He said, I say it all the time. Did you get that or not? He said, I, he said, I don't leave the house without decreeing. The favor of God is on me. Great and good things. Are, do you remember what Brother Oral Roberts used to say all the time? Something good is going to happen to you today. And, and you hear people say, oh, you know, what? Why does he say that? Well, see, you, you obviously are, are lacking seriously in understanding of Scripture because even Christianity itself from the beginning was called the great confession. Being saved was called, you know, confessing Christ. And that's what we're reading right here. How do you get born again? Not by doing something that can try, you try to reach heaven and get what you need. Not by going to the deepest depths and, and, and deal with that. The word of salvation and salvation itself is really close. It's as close. It's right under your nose. It's as close as your mouth and your heart. Keep, keep reading this. What did he say? It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Verse 9 that if you shall confess with your mouth 
the Lord Jesus, and, somebody say and, and, and. See, he, he said that before. Your mouth and your heart. Not just your heart. Not just your mouth. I know I'm being repetitive, but it's necessary. Say it out loud. Not just your mouth. Not just your heart. Your mouth and your heart. If you'll confess, and notice how he, he adds the words again, this is not just a mental thing, with your mouth. Anybody know what your mouth is? <laughs> so are you, are you confessing if you're not making any sound? No. With your mouth. And believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It doesn't get any more important than this. How did you get born again? How many believe you are saved? You're saved. If you died right now, you're going to go to be with Jesus. Yes, sir. You're saved from hell. You're saved from your sin. Yes, sir. Is that right? You're saved from judgment? Yes. How'd that happen? It's by grace through faith. Where'd you get to faith? By hearing words. Is that right? Yes, sir. You heard words. Yes anointed words yes. and by hearing anointed words you, you, you saw your lost condition you saw what God had done for you you saw the love of God you saw the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross and you received that Amen. and you believed that yes. but that didn't cause you to be born again right. if you just stop right there you wouldn't be saved Hold on, I'm, I'm going to explain it even further. But what, went, what, what, what happened beyond that? You responded somewhere, sometime. Maybe it was watching a broadcast on TV. Maybe it was reading a book. Maybe it was coming down to the front at a church service, whatever it was. But at some point, you acted on that, which included the most important part, confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Right? If you hadn't done that, you wouldn't be saved. You wouldn't be born again. Uh, he goes on to say in the very next verse, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. You don't believe God with your head. You don't believe God with your intellect. You don't believe God with your mind. You believe God with your heart, and faith is a choice. You hear sometimes people say, well, I just, I just can't believe all that. That's not true. You can believe anything you choose to believe. You're not saying it right. You should say, I choose not to believe it. Faith is a choice. With the heart, it's a heart choice. The heart man believes under righteousness and, somebody say and, 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 and. not one thing. Two things. With the heart you believe to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto. So when did it manifest? When did the power show up and change you from being an old dead creature into a new creation in Christ Jesus? When did the power manifest? Confession is made unto salvation. Your faith came when you heard the words of the glorious good news. And you made the right choice and you believed it in your heart, but you still weren't born again. At that particular, now all of this could have happened really, really quickly, but if you just stop at that one pinpoint, you're not saved. Power's not released yet. But when you confess Jesus as Lord of your life, that confession tapped into the power. Oh, hallelujah. And the power changed you from spiritually dead to eternally alive in Christ. And it happened when you spoke. Whoo. Oh, somebody say glory to God. 
Glory to God. It happened when you spoke. Go with me to John, the ninth chapter. John 9, the man that was, uh, was healed, born blind, then the religious leaders got all upset about it because it happened on the Sabbath day and made a big deal out of it. And so they, they questioned his parents because they didn't believe it had happened. You know, unbelievers are unbelievers. And uh, they're denying that it happened. And, and so John 9, what is it, 21? John 9, 21. They, they said, by what means does he see? Or, and, and how, you know, this story. And, and so they said, by what means he sees? We don't know. Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. This is his parents. Parents of the blind man. He's of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Well, that's kind of noncommittal, ain't it? And verse 22, you see why. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. They had made that known that if, you, if anybody confess, and so they, they were, I mean, they wouldn't touch it. I mean, here their own boy, born blind, now grown man, miraculously healed by the power of God, they know he's healed, and yet they're afraid to say anything about who it was or, or what. They said, we don't know. We don't know. Ask him. And they said it because if any man confessed that Jesus was the Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. Why, why would they even do that? Why would they make such a rule? Why? Why? Go, go to the 12th chapter of John. John 12. Now the earlier part of that passage said that though he had done so many miracles, yet most of the people did not believe on him. Now that shows you that seeing miracles won't give you faith. You can have a miracle happen right in front of your eyes. And you can doubt it if you want to. You do not have to believe. You can imagine all kind of things. Like we said earlier, faith is a choice. Yes. And even, how many believe that those people that heard Jesus preach, they heard the best preaching they had ever heard in their life? Yes. Did he do it right? Yes. Did he make mistakes? <laughs> he did it right. Yeah. And yet, people rejected him by the thousands. They saw Right before their eyes, blind people see, deaf people hearing, lame people walking, uh, oppressed people delivered. They saw, they saw it happen by the hundreds and by the thousands, and they still went away disbelieving, rejected. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And here in verse 42, they said, nevertheless, John 12, 42, among the chief rulers... Also, there were many that believed on him. Huh? Huh? Who? <laughs> Who? Chief rulers. Chief rulers. But because of the Pharisees, they, they what? They wouldn't what? They, they wouldn't confess him lest they be put out of the synagogue. So even if you were a chief ruler in the synagogue, yeah. they had made this rule that if you confess Christ, yeah. you, they pull your papers, buddy. You're, you're gone. You are not welcome in the synagogue, and they take your name off the roll. Yeah. If you did what? Confess. If you did what? Confess. Why? How many believe the enemy was behind this? Yes. Why would he be, why would he care, and why would he make this the rule? Why? With the heart, 
man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you believe something in your heart, you're not done. But when you confess it out of a faith-filled heart, power is released. And the enemy wanted to prevent the power being released. And he doesn't want it to spread. They would not confess him, lest they be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now centuries later, I wonder how they feel about it. Was it worth denying the Lord for the temporary acceptance of these misguided, deceived Pharisees? They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Should we think more about what God knows? About what we imagine people may think? You don't even really know what people think. And a lot of times they don't know what they think. And even if they think they know, it'll change next week. Now we're laughing, but how many people govern their lives trying to maintain the rapport with other people, what they imagine people are thinking, or well, I don't want people to think bad of me, and I don't want to think, you know. Uh, man, I, uh, maybe you thought when you, after you got in here today and you saw how we act up and, and <laughs> how we believe, and all of a sudden, oh, man, did I go into the wrong place? People might have seen me go in there. And, and uh, they may think I'm one of them. You need to be one of them. You, you better forget what they think. Are they? Do you want? Did you hear about these miracles that Kim read about? That's right, yeah. Did you hear about these things? We hear, a, we see a constant stream of these. Why? 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 You believe in your heart, That's right. That's and, right. and, yeah. and, yeah. and, yeah. and, you confess with your mouth. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you a question. Back up to verse forty-two. The chief rulers, they believed on him. Were they, sa were they saved? Huh? Huh? Why? They wouldn't confess him. So it's not enough to believe it, but you won't say it. And it's not enough to say it, but you don't believe it. Can you see this, friends? And this answers so many reasons things didn't happen. They believed it, but they wouldn't act on it. So no power was released. The number one way you act on it is with your words. That's not the whole thing. There are other actions that accompany too, but the number one thing is your words. And there are times people have said things, but they didn't believe it. They weren't, they weren't persuaded in their heart. Yeah. They're trying it out. So believing it and not saying it, no results. Right. Saying it, not believing it, no results. No results. No. Believe it in your heart. Yep. Say it with your mouth. Yep. New creation. <laughs> oh, huh? Yep. Huh? And if God can recreate your inner man, certainly he could do some repair work on your already existing body. All right? Set you free from some mental oppression or get some money into your life. Is that right? I mean, so many things, but it works on the same principle. You got to believe it in your heart and Confess it with your mouth. I want you to notice this. In uh, 1 John, 1 John 2, look at a couple of places here. You got a couple more minutes? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Has this been worth talking about already this morning? This is important. Oh, the devil has done his best to rob the church of this. 
And so you've got millions of good church going people, but they won't open their mouths. They won't speak against problems. They won't speak increase or blessing over anything. They think that's weird. That's strange. It's only because it's been lost from the church now for generations, but it's how the church started. And it's how, if you're born again, it's how you got born again. And it's how everything works. The Bible said, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You continue to walk and live by faith in the same way that you were born again by faith. Believing in your heart and confessing or saying with your mouth. 1 John 2, 23. We know those rulers were not saved because of verses like this. He said, verse 223, 1 John, whoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son, and that's the same word that's translated confess or profess in other places. In fact, that's one of the principal meanings of the word confess is to acknowledge or it also means to say the same thing. And so when you are confessing what the Lord said, you are saying the same thing that he said. You are agreeing with him. If he says you're forgiven, then you say you're forgiven. If he says you're cleansed, then you say you're cleansed. If he says you're the righteousness of God in Christ, then if he says you're healed, then if he says your needs are met, then but the enemy is continually trying to get words in your mouth that will work against yourself that he can have a right to act on and manifest on. And, and the whole world is so negative flowing in this that most people don't even notice it when they are damaging and hurting themselves with their own mouth. You know, Brother, Brother Jerry Savell talked about, he said, uh, that the Lord told him that the more that he acknowledged it, this favor and blessing on his life, then the more he would expect it. And the more he expected it, the more he would experience it. Did you hear that? Is that true? Man, if you really believed that, what would you get to doing? Acknowledging and confess. Didn't the Bible say that we are to acknowledge every good thing that is in us, in Christ Jesus, huh? Are we? And so he's going around, say, he's been saying it for 50 years. He said, I say it every day. I say it all the time that the favor of God is on him and God is doing things for him everywhere he goes and it's happening. Amazing things are happening. How many people talk like that every day? Very rare. A lot of people, what do they say? Well, nothing good ever happens to me. Now, there's a lot of difference between that <laughs> and, and the favor of God is on me every day, everywhere. I, what a radical difference that is. Huh? Nothing good ever happens to me. The people don't even notice. Everything I do, it seems like a, every time I start making a little progress, I, I just get knocked back, knocked on my, off my feet. You know, it seems like I can't ever do anything right. I, I, can't, I can't ever do anything to please them. You know that's a lie. Yeah. Even if it was eight out of ten things didn't please them. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You're still telling a lie. That's right. Right. Hmm? But see, what, what is pushing you to be so adamant and even so angry and so bitter to say, and, and can you tell how adamant people are when they say, you seems like that? I mean, my life is, is terrible. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a failure. Why do they say it so adamant? They believe it. I said, they believe it. Nothing good ever happens to me. I don't know all this God stuff and the, the bitterness. They believe it in their heart. And they're saying it with their mouth. Is that going to release power too? Yeah. The enemy has a right to bring that. That's his territory. He has a right to work with that. That's why he tries so hard to get it in your mouth. That's what's common, not what Brother Jerry was talking about. I'm going to talk like he, he's talking about. Uh -huh. yes, sir. The blessing of the Lord's on me. 
Hallelujah. It makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. Everywhere I go, he gives me victory. The favor of God is on me and on mine. It's on Faith Life Church. I speak over you from time to time. You don't mind, do you? Oh, come on. You should. I said I speak over you from time to time. You don't mind, do you? Now, you got to agree with it, though. You got to agree with it. Faith life people. We're so blessed. The blessed people call us blessed. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't say it. But because I believe it, I don't just stop there. I, I say it. First, thank you. First John 4. Notice this. And this, this is an eye opener here. I trust it. It quickens you. First John 4 and 1. The Spirit of God said through John, Beloved, your ears should perk up when you hear that word. Somebody say, he's talking about me. Right. You are the beloved in Christ. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Look at your neighbor, help him out right now and say, do not believe everything you hear. Now you would think we know this, but I'm just, I'm appalled sometimes at some of the things I see even Christians and even ministers saying and doing. They, they believe stuff and you're thinking, well, how do you know that? Well, well so-and-so said, how do they know it? When it comes to God, you believe what he said without question. Everybody else? No. You check it out. You, you listen, you check your heart, you check the word, you check the spirit. When it comes to God, quick to believe. Other people, especially strangers, slow, very slow to believe. No, just because you love people don't mean you believe everything they say. Examine what you're believing about politics. Hmm? About politicians. About things that have happened. Beware of conspiracies. Who said it? How do they know it? Were they there? Then how do you know it? Then don't say it like you know it. Don't say it like you know it when you know you don't know it. You need to say, well, I don't know. I wasn't there. Look at the other neighbor. Say, do not believe everything you hear. Yeah, but, yeah, but so-and-so said that they, they knew somebody that saw and knew. That means you don't know a thing. <laughs> you don't know a thing. Please, don't be so gullible. Don't be so easily misled. Lies are everywhere. And it's how the enemy does so much damage is he gets a bunch of people. You know what deception is, right? It's believing that a lie is true. And wars have been fought over these things. People have been totally convinced that this is true and they get all upset about it. And it's not even so. Or it's a half truth twisted into something else. It's, be, be very watchful about this child of God. Don't, don't be gullible. Don't, don't let the enemy play you. And then let him, you know, make you somebody to spread it. You, you retweet it and, and post it and tell everybody like it's the truth, like it's a fact, and you don't have a clue if it is or not. You weren't there. You didn't see it. You don't know them. This is the Holy Spirit through your pastor trying to help you out. 1 John 4 and 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. But what? That means test. Test them. 
To see what? Whether they're of God. What does that mean? Not everything that's spiritual is of God. Not everything that's real is of God. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. And they're real. And they're spiritual. But they're not God. Verse 2. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Here he, he said is how you can know what's the Spirit of God. Every spirit that what? That what? That what? Of all the things you could be talking about. Of what confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. He said that's of God. Verse 3. And every spirit that what? Confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come. And even now already it's in the world. That was back then years ago. This should stand out to us. The devil is the father of lying. You talk about lying. He is the master of lying. Why wouldn't he just lie about it? Huh? Why wouldn't his emissaries and spirits just lie when questioned about, you know, did Jesus come in the flesh? Why wouldn't they just lie? This is the one thing that an evil spirit will never, ever, under any circumstances, do. What? Confess Christ. Why? Why? Because that's where the power is released. I said that's where the power is released in confessing Christ. Oh, hallelujah. And when we, we should see how significant that is, how powerful that is, and it ought to make you want to confess every day of your life. Right? It ought to make you want to confess Christ. It ought to make you want to affirm your confession of Christ. And it ought to want, make, make you want to acknowledge and confess and confirm and affirm everything he ever said about you or to you or through you. Why? Because that's when the power is released. Woo! Somebody say glory to God. 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 Go to Hebrews, please, the second chapter. Hebrews chapter 2. I need to give you a few more verses. You got time? Yes, sir. That'd be a good confession right there. I'll have plenty of time. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Now you're laughing, but how many Christians say, we just never have enough time? We're just so busy. How y'all doing? Ah, pretty good. That's a bad confession. Hmm? That's all you want is pretty good. See, people don't believe in the words of their mouth. They just talk how they feel. They talk about their experiences. They talk about things relative to other people's experiences. God uses his words to create and to change things. And, and Jesus operated that way. And we're told to be followers or imitators of God as dear children. We're supposed to operate that way too. How you doing? How you doing? Come on, help me out. I'm flourishing, I'm, I'm overcoming, I'm, I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Huh? How you doing? <laughs> Hebrews 2, 17, talking about Jesus, said, In all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself suffered being tempted, he's able to succor or help those that are tempted. Is he our high priest? Yes. 
Say that like Jesus is my high priest. Jesus. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That's the exact same Greek word that's translated confession in these other verses that we've been reading. Confession. It means, it's the same word. It means acknowledge, say the same thing. Jesus is called the apostle of our confession. The apostle, the high priest of our confession. Is, do you think that's significant? Yes. What does that mean? He works with our words. Oh, did you hear that or not? Yes. Say it out loud. He works in my life, my life. With, my words. with my words. And this is, this is numerous places in the Word. He said, by your words you'll be justified. By your words you'll be judged. Jesus said it. By whose words? Whose words? words. Your words. Yes, now here's, here's a statement many people wouldn't even believe. Your words carry more weight in your life than anybody else's including God's. Wow. You might say, no, no, Brother Keith. Yes, because he set it up that way. Yeah. If he says that you're saved by what Jesus did and the right, made the righteousness of God, and you say, no, I'm not, I don't believe in all that, whose words carry more weight in your life? Yes, sir. Yeah. He works with your words. Say it out loud, God. God. The Son of God, Son of God. Is, my is my high priest of my confession. Of my confession. He, is he is the apostle of what I say. What I say. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. Really? Yes, sir. Have we talked about this enough? Yeah. I don't think so. No. Has the church emphasized this enough? He's the apostle of what I say. He's the high priest of my confession. Skip down to the fourth chapter, over to the fourth chapter, and verse 12. This is not an isolated instance. You'll see this repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. The Word of God is quick, living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Is the Word of God absolutely awesome? Yes. It is beyond what we have understood. And the truth is, our entire the outcome of our entire life and our eternity will be the result of our response to His words. The outcome of our entire life and our eternity will be the result of our response to what he has said, his words. Whether we reject it, ignore it, refuse to say it, act on it, or whether we believe it, receive it, confess it, act on it, that's what's determining the outcome of our lives and our eternity. Verse 13, keep going. Neither is there any creature or creation that's not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Verse 14, knowing that and seeing, and this goes back to the previous chapter we read, that we have a great high priest. Do we have a great high priest? Yes. This passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, seeing we have this, what's supposed to be our response? Let us hold fast our profession, confession. Let us hold, that's our part. But what do you mean? Say what he said, no matter what you see. No matter what you feel, no matter what anybody else says, you say what he said. You say what he said. Isn't that what Brother Jerry was talking about? He found out in the Word of God and by the Spirit of God 
that favor belongs to him, not just him, all of us. He, but he found out about it and he accepted it. And he believes it, so he put his mouth in gear. Can you see that? And he said, I say it all the time. I say it every time I leave the house. What? The favor of God is on me. The goodness of God is on my life. Everywhere I go, good things happen for me. Now, how many people talk like that every day? Very, very, very few. How many churchgoers talk like that? Very, very, very few. Very few. Which is why very few are experiencing that. But you could be one of the very few. And I'm confessing that faith life people in Branson, Missouri, and Missouri and Arkansas and uh, Sarasota, Florida and, and, and Georgia and all through there and, and partners all over the country and in other countries that are joined with us and believe this in their heart and were willing to say it with their mouths, yes. Yes. prosper yes. and excel yes. and overcome yes. and live in the fullness yes. of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. You can't control what everybody else believes. You can't, and a lot of people are never going to believe this. A lot of church going people are never going to believe this. They'll just mock and scoff and make fun of us. And we'll be enjoying the blessing all the time they're <laughs> mocking and scoffing. And in many cases, we'll be able to help them later in spite of it. Glory to God. My mouth belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. It was made to speak blessing, not cursing. It was made to speak healing, not hurt. It was made to speak love, not hate. It was made to speak faith, not fear, not doubt. <laughs> This is helping us. Oh, this, this is helping us. Seeing that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast, hold on to that confession for we have not a high priest which can up, now hold on, hold on, hold on. Why would he say you got to hold on to that confession for you've got this high priest? Why? He's working with your words at the throne. He's working with your words. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Don't separate that from him being the high priest of your confession. What do you say when you come boldly before the throne? What are you doing? You're standing there crying, feeling sorry for yourself. He can't work with that. I said he can't work with that. He can't work with pitiful. He can't work with fear and unbelief. You got to give him something to work with. Give him something he can work with. What can he work with? He can work with his words in your mouth. He can do miracles in your life with his words in your mouth. Mm -mm. Hebrews 10, in the mouth of two or three witnesses and four and five witnesses, and let every word be established. Hebrews 10, 21, in case you didn't get it the first uh, three times. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. What do you do with your heart? You believe under righteousness and, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, verse 23, having all that, do what? Do what? Let us what? 
why would the Lord keep telling you more than once? Repeat, hold, hold fast to what you're saying, your confession. Yeah. Why would he say that? Because the enemy is going to fight you on this. Yeah. He will do everything he can to get you to shut up, to discourage you, to distract you, to confuse you, but to get you to stop speaking the word of God. Because it really just messes up his business. It upends things for him, which is why you ought to do it every day of your life. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Faithful to do what? He's faithful to represent you at the throne. He's faithful to be the apostle and high priest of your confession of what you're saying. He's faithful. Faithful. Two more scriptures. I think. 1 Timothy 6. And I think we'll go from there to Revelation 12, and I think we'll be done for the moment. But you told me you had plenty of time. How about your money? <laughs> plenty of money? How about your health? Huh? Wisdom? Favor? Huh? Life is hard for you, isn't it? It's just a hard knock life, right? It's a, it's a hard old road. Huh? Life is hard. Whew. Huh? Huh? Well, you can walk by sight. You can talk what you see. You can talk what you feel. And the Lord can't work with those words. But the enemy can. I said, to him, oh, he's rubbing his hands. <laughs> he's like, say that again. You can't, you can't stand it, right? You can't take it anymore, right? And he'll poke you. you and you'll cry and scream, I can't take it anymore. He goes, that's it, boys. Get on him. Hit him. He said it. He said he can't take it anymore, so put him where he can't take it anymore. You got a right to. I can't. I, I, I have sat with people trying to minister to people before that screamed for an hour. I can't. I just can't. I mean, it's even unreasonable that they just kept saying it, but it's spiritual. Who is pushing them to talk such desperation. I, but I can't, I can't, I can't. Did the Bible ever tell you you can't? No. Never. So who put that word in their mouth? The devil himself. And they were foolish enough to just take it and say it. The scripture said you'll decree a thing and it'll be so for you. That's good or bad. You could be saying, I can I can. I can do all things through Christ who strength. Right? I can. Come on, try it out loud. Try it out loud. I can. I can. can. Yeah, but see everything around you say, you can't do this. You can't. You'll never have one of them. You say, oh, yes, I will. Oh, yes, I will. You can't do that because you're a this and you're a that and they don't know and you never had and, and they won't let. And, and if you believe all that stuff, you're stuck. Oh, but you could grab a hold of the scripture. Is there a verse in Philippians? Seems like I remember something. Huh? I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. What if you said that every time you felt like you couldn't? Instead of saying you can't, what if you said that? Power would manifest to enable you and empower you to do it. That's what would happen every time. 1 Timothy 6.12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. How do you do that? Are there any words involved? In this same uh, book, in this same chapter, uh, he calls, or excuse me, um, and it's actually Ephesians that goes with this. In talking about the armor of God, he calls the Word of God the sword of the Spirit. 
It's actually the word rhema. The rhema of God. The word of God is the, the sword of the spirit. That's how you fight. You fight with words. That's how you fight a spiritual fight. And notice it's right here in, the, in this text. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto you are called and have what? Have what? Professed. A good profession in front of many witnesses. And he's not through talking about that. I give you charge in the sight of God. Now, now see, you got to go back to the phrase. What's he, he's telling Timothy? Fight. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't be wimpy. Don't be weak. Fight. What, what kind of fight? The good fight of faith. How you do that? With your confession. Your confession. And he gives us the example. I give you charge in the sight of God who quickens all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a what? Good confession. How did Jesus overcome every satanic attack? How did he overcome the greatest tests and trials of his own personal life and ministry? How? How? When he went out into the wilderness and was tempted, how, what did he do? It is written. It is written. It is also written. Get behind me, Satan. How'd he do it? How'd he do it? Huh? And on the cross, how did he do it? How'd he do it? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Hallelujah. Words. Somebody say words, 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 words. Faith-filled words release the power of God. And our faith is in the power of God. Go to Revelation 12. Revelation 12 talks about the end and the end of the enemy's freedom and ability to work. Won't that be a wonderful day when the devil is permanently removed? from human contact and you will never have to deal with him or any of his ever again. You just, you got to make it a few more days and then we're going to be done with him forever. Thank God. But here he said, verse chapter, Revelation 12 and 9, the great dragon was cast out. The, uh, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. What is the principle means of his attack and onslaught against us. His accusing words. His accusations, his lies, his deceptions, his condemnation. And it's, I wish I could tell you that you could beat it and be done with it, but in this life, he's gonna come back tomorrow and try it again. What's the solution? You don't give in, you don't receive it, you don't believe it, and you never say it. You never say it, therefore not giving him a right to act on it in your life. How, you know the next verse, how do you overcome an enemy like that? How do you fight the good fight of faith? He mentioned confession, what, three or four times in that same passage, right? What is Jesus, the apostle and high priest of? My confession. So hold fast to your confession. Hold fast to your confession. Hold fast to your confession. Tell your neighbor, help them out. Hold fast. Hold fast to your confession. They overcame him, this lion, sorry, low down evil, devil, 
They overcame him by two things. Come on. Yes. Not one. Someone says, well, he overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. No, if you won't confess Jesus, the blood of the Lamb won't manifest power in your life. Mm -mm. And, and, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Now, there wouldn't be anything to confess if it wasn't for the blood of the Lamb. There wouldn't be any victory. There wouldn't be any deliverance. Oh, but thank God there is. And that blood speaking right now today off the mercy seat. And that blood never loses its power. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by, by the words that were coming out of their mouth. The words that they held fast to their confession. The words that the high priest and apostle of their confession could work with. The word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Somebody say they overcame him. They overcame him. They overcame him. How? They're fighting a good fight of faith. What? With that profession. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and with the words of their testimony. You are a witness before the high court of heaven. And your testimony carries spiritual weight in that high court. And Jesus is your advocate representing you before the throne, but your testimony has to agree with what he is presenting before the throne. You must not disagree with him. You must not say the opposite of what he said. You must agree with what your advocate says. He works. Say it out loud. He works, he works. with my words, with my words. When, I speak his words. when I speak his words. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, 14 through 15. And this is where we're going to close tonight. If you can receive it. Is this scripture? He said, if you can receive it. And he's talking about John. And John being, he said, this is Elijah. Or this is Elias, depending on your translation. In other words, that there was, this, there was a prophecy in Malachi, Micah, talking um, about how Elijah would come before the day of the Lord, before the Lord came. And he's, he, being Jesus, declared to the people about John, if you can believe it, if you can receive it, if you're willing, this is what it comes down to, if you're, your will. Faith is, he was talking about faith is a choice. Faith is a choice. Faith is a choice to, be, to, to hear. It's not just a choice to believe. It's a choice to hear what's being taught. I just can't believe it. No, 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 no. I just won't hear it. I won't position myself to allow those words to teach me as if this is what's going on. I know better. I know more. I know more. Why am I unwilling to hear? Because of what I see, what I think I know, my experience, or what I thought it would look like. This is what he's talking about with John. He's a guy coming out of the wilderness, eating locusts and honey, and dressed in camel hair. But the spirit and power of Elijah, the, the, he, he's what he came in, but he's, the Lord Jesus said, this is Elijah, if, if you're willing to accept it. He is the Elijah that was to come. And they're like, nah, it was going to look like this. It was going to look like Elijah, power. It was going to look like this. And so they shut it, shut down that he was the Messiah. He goes on to say the next verse. What does he say? Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. This right here is where faith starts. By you and I saying, that's the word. That's God's word. Oh, that's God's word. Say that again. Tell me that. Show me that again. 
Show me that again. Uh, okay, I, I didn't see. So you take this and you carry the one and then you drop that. And okay, show me how that, how did you get that? Show me that again. And when you and I position ourselves in that place to hear, then faith comes. And what happens is when faith comes, it takes up residence in your heart. And then you're not making yourself say something. You're actually, it's not lip service. It's truth. Because you believe it. Because you were willing to hear it. So he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Man, this is where it starts. Lord, teach me today. When every, t- every time you open up the Word of God, teach me, Lord. Show me. This is your Word. This is your holy Word. But the moment I call into question, see, what I question, I stand over. And what I stand over, I, I no longer receive from. It's just like that picture we talk about, like a pitcher of water. In order to receive what's in there, I'm going to have to bring myself under. And so tonight, we're going to we're gonna close uh, tonight uh, service with uh, a few confessions. Uh, let's stand on our feet tonight. We're going to cl- close with this. We got just wrote a couple... Um, a couple of declarations that we can maybe partner with. You might insert your own words in here if you put up slide four, and then we'll go to number one. So, well, I'm depressed. Well, I'm this. Well, I'm that. Well, I don't have enough. Wasn't that good when he was talking that? It kind of got you a little bit changed, and you know, it's like, wait a minute. What do you, you you got? You got enough? Yeah, I got enough. You got? To, yeah, yeah. Like there was just a, there was hope. Because your words were actually declaring even a picture to you. Words declare pictures to you. So I could, I, could, I could show you something with your eyes closed by just me speaking. So here we are. We're going we're gonna to make this a, a confession tonight. Confession, a profession. Sometimes I've heard Pastor Mark Hankins say this. You're going to have to become a professional professor. Anyway. you got to profess something. you got to be good at it. you got to... All right, make it your own. All right, so there you can go. With this, you can do this with me. All right, all right. So there is no depression or hopelessness in our household because we know and are convinced we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Thank you, Lord. So there's no depression. There's no hopelessness. Well, I'm not hopeless. Why? Why am I not hopeless? Because I, I believe that I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. That is scripture. That God, this is scripture. And who's, who's, what does he take? He takes your words and he's the apostle or the sent one to bring it about. I call our house and this house blessed in Jesus' name. Woo, a bless. That, isn't it interesting how many, how many, even just not too long ago, how people would believe in a curse or a blessing? Oh, we got a family curse. We're cursed. We're cursed. If someone was to hex you or curse you, people would be like, oh, boy, you'd have the heebie-jeebies. And the, you'd think, oh, this is why this is happening. Because you believe in a curse and a blessing. The Bible talks about the curse from your mouth, blessing and cursings out of your mouth, because it's true. Our eyes are bright. Our hearts are filled with truth. Our lips speak words of life and truth. We'll, we will be a blessing to many, and 2024 will be our best year of our lives. Woo! That's a good thing. It's going to be a good year. It's going to be good. It's going to be good for me. It's going to be good for we. Next, next one, slide one. These are good. Are you going to write some of your own confession? Sometimes you're going to have to just steer the course of your life. If you don't like the way it's been going, just grab that steering wheel called the tongue. And start making that U-turn or making that left turn. Our children and grandchildren are taught of the Lord, obedient to His will. And great is their peace and undisturbed composure. They are established in righteousness. Oppression is far from them, for they shall not fear. Ooh, my children aren't afraid. But you're not afraid. You make that declaration. I'm not, I'm not afraid. Well, I'm, oh, I'm scared. No, I'm scared. No, no, no. Say it not afraid. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. Say it. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. Wow. wow. You, you put that in your kids' mouth. 
We are increased more and more, spirit, soul, and body, relationally, financially, and influentially, us and our children. Amen. Woo, the influence. You know why God put you on that job? To influence. I heard this just recently. You could be the janitor, the lowest ranking, lowest ranking job. But if you're the only believer there, you're the highest rank in that place. And you can change that place. We are filled with the love of God, the wisdom of God, and the fire of God. Our souls are at rest and flourishing in peace and understanding. Our relationships are strong, loving and kind, forgiving and flourishing. Wealth and riches are in our house, and our righteousness endures forever. We are ever able and ever ready to be a blessing to those around us and to give abundantly to every good work. We are kingdom carriers in our generation. You know why I'm ever ready? Because there's more where that came from. I'm ever ready, ever looking to bring the supply that he, that he because he, he's my source. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And my God shall supply. Not, not Nate, not just my, not my hands. Lord, he blesses what I set my hands to. Amen. I'm telling you, put the word of God in your mouth. Start. It's how salvation, the just shall live by faith. This is not something that you get saved and you stop. And this is something that, you know, last week was really great. And, and we're just building, or building, we're building. Here's what we're doing. We're just teaching the Word. This is not, this is not radical. This is righteous. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for your Word tonight. Thank you for all that you're doing in this house and these families. Thank you for the influence and for calling uh, just, just these, these families to you. For lives changed, for destinies, for whole families and, and the, this town, for businesses uh, just transformed by, by your power. Just the goodness of God brought here on earth, we just pray tonight, as in heaven. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done here, Lord, in our families, in our businesses, in this place. We love you. We say thank you for being the great teacher. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. We will see you Sunday morning.